<laughs> molecules and ions. Electrons are the only subatomic particles involved in bonding and chemical reactivity. The sooner you wrap your head around this, the easier life is going to be conceptually. So as we talk about chemical activity, chemical bonding, we talk about electrons here. Chemical bonds, they are forces that hold atoms together, right? These are hold, holding, holding molecules together, right? Holding atoms together to create molecules. This would be an intramolecular force, right? Intra, meaning within the molecule, right? It's holding the atoms together to form the molecule. There are a couple different types of bonds. One of the bond, uh, types of bonds that we are going to look at quite a bit, covalent bonds. The atoms that share electrons and make molecules, meaning independent units, right? Here's some examples. We've got hydrogen, carbon dioxide, water, and this is ammonia. Want off the page a little bit? That is ammonia. So I hope you just get okay with the fact that this is ammonia. Right? It doesn't. Uh, we don't. No one uses the systematic name. And um, by the way, this is even written incorrectly. It should be written like that. But since this is an organic molecule and gets a lot of play in organic chemistry, they care more about what the central atom is in the bond, and so they they list that first. Okay. But the actual name of this would be trihydrogen nitride. <coughs> Excuse me. No one calls it that. No one calls it that. Call it ammonia. Kind of in the same way, no one calls this tetrahydrogen carbide. Like no, no one, no one calls it that. They call it methane. So again, get used to that. That is a methane. That is methane. So a molecule is the smallest unit of a compound that retains the chemical characteristics of the compound. Does that sound similar to our definition of an of an atom? Right? It, it should strike a bell there, but instead of saying atom, we're saying molecule here. It's the smallest unit, unit of a compound, right? So it's not an atom. Okay? It's a compound that retains the chemical characteristics of that compound. But once atoms combine to form a molecule, the characteristics of the constituent, which means the things that go into it that came together, the characteristics of the constituent elements are lost. Right, so water, for example, is a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. When you have hydrogen by itself, it's very, very flammable, very, very combustible. Oxygen, uh, we don't, wouldn't necessarily say that oxygen is combustible. It, it's a, it's a key component of combustion. Uh, but they're both very, very flammable, very, very explosive. But when you put them together into a molecule that we would call water. It's not very explosive anymore, is it? We actually use it to put out explosions, right? So the, the characteristics of the individual elements are lost. Now, there are a couple different ways that we can communicate what type of molecule we're talking about. We can have the molecular formula, the type of which we wrote up here, right? Where we use symbols and subscripts to represent the composition of the molecule. Um, we also have the structural formula where we actually show what elements are bonded to what elements. Uh, the bonds are showed by lines. Okay, So each line represents a shared pair of electrons. And it doesn't necessarily indicate the shape. Sometimes they do. right? There's, there's a style. There's a style of drawing that is uh, designed to try to help you picture uh, what the molecule actually looks like in three dimensions. Right? It's called the wedge dash format for structural formulas. Um, uh, we're not going to work with that all that much, but we will talk about it uh, a little bit later in the course. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the reasons we want to practice this when we get there is because out of Gardner's seven intelligences, spatial intelligence is one of the last to develop in terms of you know chronology. And so your ability to look at this two-dimensional representation, bring it up off the paper in your mind and rotate it in your brain like it was a three-dimensional hologram. Uh, it is a skill that uh, comes on a little bit later in development, right? Some of you are probably able to do that just fine now. Some of you might not be. But one of the things that will help is practice, right? If you guys don't know, uh, Gardner's Seven, uh, Seven Intelligences uh, was a big was a big uh, release like 20 or 30 years ago. 
uh, where he listed the different types of intelligences. You know, music was one, and art was one, and uh, math was one, spatial was yet another one. All these different intelligences that, um, you know, people have different amounts of uh, based on the predispositions and training. Then we have ions. Ions are formed when electrons are lost or gained in ordinary chemical reactions, which means not nuclear. No. Ordinary chemical reactions. Uh, when electrons are uh, lost or gained, there's a dramatic change in size, right? So, for example, when we have a cation, which is a positively charged ion, uh, by the way, it's mo usually it's a metal because metals tend to lose electrons, and when you lose an electron, you can become positively charged. Well, if you look over here at this uh, crystal of sodium chloride, this sodium, right, it just lost an electron. It lost a particle, and so obviously it's going to be it's going to become smaller, right? It has it has fewer particles, but not only that, uh, the number of charges in the nucleus stays the same, right? It, it wouldn't be sodium anymore if we had changed the number of protons. And so the, the amount of charge coming out of the nucleus, the nuclear charge is the same, but it's being distributed uh, uh, across fewer electrons now because we just lost one. And so that nucleus is going to have the ability to hold those remaining electrons even closer into the nucleus. The opposite happens with an anion. Anions are typically nonmetals because nonmetals gain electrons to satisfy uh, the noble gas electron configuration. And when they gain an electron, they become negatively charged. Go back to our uh, representation of sodium chloride crystal over here. That chloride is a very large uh, ion. It actually gets bigger. Not only because it's gained uh, a particle, but that particle is negatively charged and it's been shoved in with a bunch of other negatively charged particles and so you know it's, it's more crowded in there and because like repels like these negatively charged electrons repel the other negatively charged electrons already in the chlorine's electron cloud and so they have to spread out they have to spread out even further than they already were making the absolute size the absolute volume of that uh, chloride larger than the neutral atom uh, we have polyatomic ions right poly meaning many atomic meaning atoms so it's an ion that is made up of many atoms <coughs> they're units of atoms behaving as one entity it, uh, and it is worth memorizing nine polyatomic ions and three patterns and I'm gonna try to get you a, a separate handout to make that a little bit easier you actually probably uh, already know these or at least if I had talked about them again which I will um, you, you, would, you would remember them, right? It would be, it'd be at least familiar to you. But it's worth memorizing them uh, because it makes reading questions and moving forward in certain problem-solving uh, situations just a, just a lot easier. It makes it a lot smoother. Then we have ionic solids, right? Ionic solids, uh, when electrostatic forces are holding ions together, right? They're strong enough that they keep them fixed in place. They're an ionic solid. Remember, solids, uh, back from Chapter 1, uh, they vibrate around a fixed point. Well, the reason that they're vibrating around a, a fixed point is because the electrostatic forces are so strong that they force them. They hold them in place very, very tightly. They, they can't move. Uh, and we can actually calculate the magnitude of those electrostatic forces using Coulomb's law. Uh, when these electrostatic uh, attractions are strong, the ions are held together tightly and are close together. And we call that a solid. We right? call that a solid. Additionally, the stronger the Coulombic force, represented by... Uh, capital F sub C, the higher the melting point, because that means in order to melt it, that means to get this substance to transition from the solid state into the liquid state, you're going to require more energy to do that. Why are you going to require more energy? Because there's so much force. More force has to be overcome to allow the substance to move into the liquid state, right? So the stronger the Coulombic force, the higher the melting point. <coughs> so last thing on this uh, this video, the uh, uh, Coulomb's law. It's actually pretty simple. We look at this a little bit in, in chemistry as we try to understand the movement of charges, the movement of uh, ions. But you also use this in physics. So if you took physics before you're taking this AP chemistry class, you probably work with this uh, quite a bit already. <coughs> and it's a fairly simple setup, right? Q represents the quantity of charge, right? Quantity of charge of object one, quantity of charge of object two. 
and then the force is calculated by dividing the algebraic product of those two charges by the square of the distance between them, right? The diameter of the distance. Or let's just say the distance. How about that? <coughs> now, this, this K is a constant. It's a Coulomb's constant. It's used basically just to get the units correct, right? Because you have a charge, a charge, and then a length, right? So <coughs> that's not a unit of force. So we introduced this constant to make everything work out well. The basic idea is when distance is a smaller number, you're going to get a greater force, right? <coughs> so that means when the two charged particles are closer together, the force is going to be greater. When the two objects are further apart, meaning when this distance is a larger number, the force is going to be weaker. And that makes sense algebraically because you're dividing by a larger number. Right? When the force is great, it's because those two charges are really close to one another. This number is small. You're dividing this value by a smaller number, so you get a larger Coulombic force. <coughs> Let's see. When calculating Coulombic force, <coughs> which we will uh, a couple of times this year, uh, we'll just be using whole numbers. We'll just be using you know, you know, integers, right? Uh, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, positive 1, positive 2, positive 3. And so you plug these in here, and when you calculate the force, when you actually get it, right, when you get it, with the force that you calculate, when you calculate a number that is less than zero, meaning negative, the force is considered an attractive force. When the force is greater than zero, which means it is a positive number, when you calculate a positive number for this force, <coughs> that force is considered a repulsive. 